Hello, Jay. Hi. Gosh, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come on to ADHD Chatter. I, I try to ask my, all my guests the same question just for continuity's sake, and I think it's super interesting for the listeners. What's your earliest memory of displaying traits of ADHD? Oh, the earliest memory. I mean, I think looking back, it was just so apparent from the get go. Um, the way I was like so hyper fixated on certain things as a child, like throughout every single stage, there was always something that was like my thing and I was obsessed with it. So the first thing was Barney. That big purple dinosaur I had my heart, I had everything that was Barney and my parents just like they knew that I had to have it. And then there was the ketchup era and I could not eat anything without ketchup. Mm. And if I was served anything and we had one in the house, it was either go to the shop and buy him ketchup or he's not eating. Because I was just like, I can't eat if it doesn't have ketchup on it. Um, so I think all of those little things, I'm like, yeah, that's so clear that I was neurodivergent at that time. But yeah yeah oh man that's so interesting um yeah I, I remember the um the dinosaur well um with those obsessions do they last or do they or do you move on to something else so quickly yeah um that was probably one of the biggest pet peeves my parents had when i was younger especially when it came to things like food because i would be obsessed with something and it's all i'd want to eat so chicken nuggets for an example It'd be like, I want that every day, morning, bre like breakfast, evening, all of it. But then two weeks later, I would pick it up and I'd be like, mom, I don't like this. And she'd be like, what? It's literally your favorite thing. And I would then have such a tantrum, an argument with my parents, because <laughs> I'm like, you don't understand. I don't like this. I hate this food. And they're like, no, you don't. You love this food. And there was just this like, okay, he's changed his mind again. Now what? Um, and then two weeks later, it'd be something new. It just keep going, and it was this repeated cycle um, where you could never get it right. Do you find that cycle of obsession and then maybe losing interest in stuff has sort of carried on into your adulthood? Yes. Yeah. I feel like I've got a million hobbies, but not a single one. And it's like my biggest awkward question. If anyone at like I don't know a job interview or a, a party is like, "Oh, what do you do for fun? What's your hobbies?" I'm like nothing in theory but if you ask me have I ever tried painting have I ever tried gaming I can tell you I probably own the materials for every single one of those hobbies I've just never successfully picked them up for a long period of time I'll try them have fun with it for a week toss it away done with it I can see huge similarities similarities between your journey and mine um I I similar uh, boom and bust sort of find an obsession and then lo lose interest in it a little bit and then I just became hooked on social media and I think you know you've clearly done the same what do you think it is that is about social media and the content creation um, business that that has kept your attention I think it's just pure dopamine in a way that no other job could kind of feed the need that I had it's the only place that changes so frequently changes so crazily um, sorry if you can hear that. My dog has decided he is very thirsty all of a sudden. <laughs> Milo, thank you. Um, so yeah, it's the only thing that kind of keeps up to the pace in which my brain needed. I'd found in every job I'd been in, even though I was working still in a social media element, it just wasn't quick enough for me. I would just get so bored on the longer projects, the back and forth. Social media, you don't have that. It's just refresh your feed and then you've got a whole new bunch of stuff to kind of engage your brain with. Mm. Absolutely. When you create a bit of content, because you're a huge personality online and your engagement is massive. Um, when you create a bit of content and you post it out and perhaps, you know, a particular bit of content doesn't hit the mark and you're analyzing its engagement for like the first minute you can see that it's not going to be a you know a banger or a, a, a how does that affect you i'd say now i am way better at just kind of putting my phone down after i've uploaded something and stepping away um before i used to be very like what was it they didn't like why is, is this not doing well and i try to find answers but the answers just aren't there sometimes it hits sometimes it doesn't Sometimes you post it and you think it's a total fail. And then two days later, 
your notifications are popping off and that video is now doing well again and it's it's a game that you kind of can't win in that sense and I knew it was taking a bit of a toll on me at one point so I just was like step away from it stop looking at the numbers just keep making the content and if the comment section is people saying this has made my day this has made me happy then that's the whole point of what I'm doing so that's what matters doesn't matter if a million people see it or 10,000 people see it it's a win either way as long as I'm getting that reaction as long as I'm doing what I'm enjoying and people are enjoying it mm. when you're if you see a negative comment someone criticizing you or do, does could you can you just brush that off I think we can now yeah it's taken a while it's definitely taken a while um and I'd be lying if I didn't say it still gets a bit tiring sometimes um but I've kind of found the humor in it almost so I've kind of not I don't take it as seriously as I probably used to I'm much more if I see a negative comment nine times out of ten they are literally the same thing just reposted in a different format um they're not very original half the time so those I'm just like Ugh, boring scroll past if I see one that's like oh I've not had someone come at me for that before I kind of find it funny and there's a few times where I've just been like screenshot send it to my friends and I'm just like this one's actually kind of funny and I can just kind of take it on the chin a bit and be like, look, I'm putting myself out there online. I know that is a consequence of doing that, but I can't focus on it and I can't let it be serious. Treat it like a joke and my brain's like, yeah, whatever. The content creation, looking at the type of person, you know, that is required to be behind that online persona or, or that character and to have that certain brain wiring to be able to do what you do like how do you think adhd um and other neurodivergent conditions perhaps have played a part in your success i think well for the first part it's definitely the fact that the content i make is very feel good high energy and with adhd you get those bursts of energy that just come out of nowhere and that is definitely what got me started doing this was that i'd be sat on the sofa fidgeting and I could feel this energy buzzing through me and I'm like, I need to get up and do something. Getting up and dancing and twerking around my living room gets it all out in a pretty productive way. So it kind of emerged that way was in a sense of like, I need to do something. I can't stop. Um, and now it's just become this like consistent thing that I know every day I get up, I get ready, I do my morning tasks and then I'm going to film. And when I'm filming, I'm doing something that is so high energy that if I'm in a bad mood or I'm not feeling that energetic that day, I don't really want to film. And I started off and I probably got a bit of a miserable face at the beginning. By the end of it, I've got energy again because I've been throwing myself around and it's fun. It's dancing. Um, mm. So it just kind of gets the body moving, the endorphins going. And then by the end of it, I'm like, oh, actually, I can do something else now. I'm in a good mood again. Do you have a, ever have any days where you're just completely burnt out and you don't have the energy? Absolutely. Um, and I think the biggest thing with those days is I used to see them as such a weakness and I used to kind of push myself through and avoid giving myself those days. Now I've completely flipped that. And if I wake up one day and I can just tell I've pushed myself to the limit and I'm like, you need to film, you need to do this. You don't. You really don't. I know if I take that day, I do minimal things, I relax, I do something that's going to just help me calm down. The next day, I'm going to come back way better, way more energy, and I'm going to go. And I think that was what I was craving and looking for when I went into social media full time and stepped away from a nine to five life was that ability to just listen to my body and my brain and work when it wants me to work and give it what it needs, um, which is something I just couldn't get with a nine to five because you can't just call up your boss and say, oh, I don't feel it today, I'm not coming in. It's not gonna work. Whereas now I can do that. But before you found the social media content creation side and you got that, I think you said earlier, pure dopamine, um, and that's clearly, I, you know, I think why, that, why you've seen the success that you have done, before you had that supply of dopamine, did you reach for dopamine in, I'll say, unhealthy ways in the past? Yeah, I'd say the way I kind of 
handled it was by just keeping myself constantly burnt out. I was constantly chasing something and I would never sit down. I would never stop. I would never just have that time to myself. So I would go to work from nine to five and then I'd immediately be looking around like, hey guys, like who wants to go to the pub? Like who wants to go out? And then that's what we would do. We'd go to the pub, we'd go out. I'd go out on a club night and come home at 2 a.m. and go to work the next day. And I would keep repeating that pattern of just like, let's just keep doing stuff because I need to keep doing stuff. Because the idea of going home and sitting there all evening, worst thing I could think of. Um, So I was definitely more inclined that way to just never give myself a break. Um, And then also shopping. I just, I love shopping anyway. But if I ever was feeling stressed or mad, I would go on my lunch break even and just go to a shop nearby and buy something I don't need because it made me feel instantly better. Um, So it was definitely that. It was shopping and just never having a break. Mm. Was was the the shopping shopping always... Did it spiral into like an unhealthy habit or was it always like under control? Um, I'd say it definitely was... I don't think it's ever really been in control it's never been too bad as in like i never put myself in a situation where i wouldn't have the rent for the month or i wouldn't be able to eat or something like that i always kind of found a way to manage it but savings were never going to happen at that point like the way i was it just was not a thing i was like yeah i'll save when i'm older like let's just be happy i really really need this thing um and then i would even get to a point where i would say i want something and I would come up with the exact reason as to why I needed it, why I had to have it. So that if anyone said, okay, but do you need it? I could reel off a million reasons as to why I did. And then I'd buy it and a week later I'd go, yeah, I didn't actually need that. But I'd convinced myself and everyone around me that this was a perfect purchase. Money and money management and ADHD combo, you know, can be an interesting mix uh it's certainly something i've struggled with in the past and i know many people have um what's your relationship with like with money management i'd say i'm still not there with it it's definitely a work in progress um i'd say i'm much better than i was before uh, especially because now i don't go into the city as much i'm you know at home most of the time so i do have less temptation around me um But then you have, you know, online shopping and the convenience of that. And it's kind of like having to learn to delete all the apps off my phone because do I need to scroll on ASOS when I'm bored? No, I don't need to do that because what will happen is the next day I'm going to have a bag full of stuff turn up. Will I return it? No, I'll forget. So then it's all just going to be staying there. And it was just this constant cycle. So, you know, (laughs) delete those apps or minimize them as much as you can. Um, And yeah, just kind of, I write up a, spreadsheet every now and then you know every other month i'll sit down and go oh this is the month where i'm going to be on a budget and i'm going to do this whole spreadsheet be really fun i'll finish the spreadsheet be really proud of it never look at it again done problem solved Mm. in my mind but then carry on spending as normal (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah so true you can sort of really get a a hyper fixate on doing something that makes you organized like making a spreadsheet or putting all your books in alphabetical order and then you just never revisit it after that dopamine has sort of de- been depleted and run out. Yeah. Going back, um, going back to the beginning again, when was ADHD first mentioned in your life? So it was never actually mentioned to me. I never had someone say like, I think you have ADHD. I think this is what's going on. I never had the doctor suggest it. It was purely just me having to figure this out myself. Um, It was during, you know, COVID and the lockdowns. And I think after about a year and a half of in and out of lockdowns and spending so much time at home, I had just lost every single coping mechanism that I had built throughout the entirety of my life. And I couldn't deal with the outside world anymore. Everything was too loud, too bright. My senses were just exploding the second I stepped outside the house. And it got to a point where I could barely work. I couldn't focus on my screen. The screen would literally go blurry in front of me. And I was just getting so frustrated. Like, who am I and what is going on? Why can't I work? Why can't I focus? Why am I just sat here all day in this kind of state of 
I don't know what's going on, but there's not much. I'm just kind of stuck. And that kind of then triggered me to go like, I need to figure out what this is. I need to, I need to get help. I need to, I can't live like this. Um, and it just so happened that I'm scrolling through TikTok and the algorithm, it knew, and it sent me an ADHD video. And it was someone who was explaining the exact same things that I was going through. And they went through that a few months prior to me. And they had just gone to their doctors and found out they had ADHD. And I was like, wait. And that was that. The second I heard there could be a title, like a name for what I was struggling with, I researched everything I could about it. I spent every day watching articles, TikTok videos, just consuming as much as I could. And that was when I was like, yeah, this is it. And I built my own case. I went to my doctor and, you know, after a few attempts, managed to get the referral. Um, and that's when everything kind of just then domino affected. When you got that diagnosis, um, it's, I've heard people, I certainly did, sort of went through waves of emotion, maybe um, relief, validation, frustration that it didn't get picked up earlier. Did you experience anything like that? Absolutely. The the day that I actually got the diagnosis, it was over a video call because of COVID, of course. Um, and the second he said it, even though I knew it was this, I knew what it was. The second I had that confirmation, I just burst into tears and I just couldn't talk. And he had to give me five minutes to just collect myself. And I was like, why has this struck me so much? Because I was so confident in my diagnosis already. I knew I was going to get it. And then after that, I thought I'd be so relieved and elated that okay I know what it is like I know who I am now but instead it was like I was grieving I was just constantly sat there with like moments from the past coming into my brain and me going oh, if I knew like if I just knew it was ADHD maybe I'd still be friends with that person maybe that work experience wouldn't have been so bad maybe that relationship would have lasted longer maybe I would never have got into that relationship there was just all these moments that would come back and it was really just overwhelming and I was a bit like I feel like I should be celebrating right especially because at that time everyone was on TikTok getting their diagnoses and they were sharing their success stories and you know everyone seemed so chirpy about it and I was sat there like well, why am I not like that why am I sat here crying on my own in my room when I should be happy so it was it was literally like going through grief and kind of having to just come face to face with all these experiences that never should have happened, but did because I didn't get access to this diagnosis and information at a younger age. I think that's so relatable what you said, and I think that will make a lot of people emotional. Um, it, did, it did with me. You, Like you said, you look back throughout your life and you see various moments, friendships, relationships, um, other moments where in hindsight, it was most likely ADHD that got in the way of it succeeding. Um, with friendships, how, how, what's, are you able to maintain friendships with people? I am, but it's very much a case of they, it, there's certain type of friendships, I would say. Um, I'm not the best at communication, especially when it comes to texting or checking in on people. That's just not how my brain operates. So I can easily go two, three weeks without talking to someone. And that's not because I don't like you. It's not because I don't love you. It literally is just because I've not seen you. So I'm busy. I'm doing something. I'm focusing on everyone that's around me right now. But I can message you in three weeks because you've popped into my brain. And for me, it's normal. It's just like I'm just carrying on from where we picked off last time. But some relationships and some people do require more than that. And that was always a struggle I had of like people getting mad at me or like me struggling to build a deep friendship with someone because everything was so surface level and superficial purely because they I, and I couldn't explain why I wasn't texting them every day or texting them every other day and why we weren't hanging out constantly. It's just like I need initiation or... You need to wait until you pop into my brain and then I'll message you and let's let's go. Um, or if I don't reply to your message for three days, it's not personal. I'm not mad. I just saw it. I was like, I'll reply to that later. And the later was three days. It's, yeah, I think it's definitely, it's been one of those 
things that I've had to learn. But through that, I think it's helped me kind of collect a circle of friends that get it, that get me, that I get them. And I think because of that, I've got better friendships than I probably would have if I was trying to please everyone. Mm. Gosh, I mean, yeah, it's so relatable. I think there's a real, as you alluded to, out of sight, out of mind element, I think. If you're not directly in front of you or me, like I'm not going to think to text you unless, like you said, you pop into your head for some whatever reason. And to have a friendship base that understand and have that awareness of how you operate and, and how they operate, I think it's vital because, like you said, it can come across as perhaps if you're not aware of how the ADHD brain works as offensive or like you're ignoring them for a reason when in fact like you said you're just into something else right now um super relatable on a similar note relationships romantic relationships um are you happy to to discuss that yeah absolutely if we could speak to a a, a past or present partner of of Jay how would they describe you in, in a romantic relationship? I think it very much would depend on which one you spoke to. <laughs> and I think that's because one thing I noticed when I got that diagnosis and I started figuring out more about my ADHD and then later on down the line finding out about autism too, I was masking so much. And when it came to relationships, I was mirroring quite a lot. I was taking traits of that person and applying them to myself. And when I think back to past relationships before I found out about any of this, I sit and think and I'm like, would I actually have ever gotten into that relationship had I have known what I know now? Not in terms of where the relationship would go, what that person was like, but if it was literally just, I met this person again for the first time and we started dating, would it have progressed to where it did? because I found myself a lot of the times in the past getting into relationships and not really knowing how I felt or what I wanted from it, but just going with the flow. And then that person developing feelings and expressing those feelings and me not quite knowing how to process my own. So going, well then, yeah, I must feel the same and I must be in the same place you are. And I would just mirror it. Whereas now I'm a lot more like, no, like if I don't feel that way, then let's just chill. Let's go slow. But I would just jump into things all the time. So I think those those relationships, if you spoke to people in the past, they would just say that if they were a needy person, they'd say I was needy. If they were distant, I was distant. It was there was no real me. There was just a different me for a different person um, up until now where I'm in a relationship now and that relationship I got into when I already knew all these things. I already did all that learning and that healing. And I went into this knowing exactly how I felt at each stage. And it was the first time where I didn't feel kind of like I'd fallen into something or pressured to maintain an appearance. I think on the first or second date, I was like, oh yeah, I have ADHD and I'm probably autistic too, but waiting to find out. And it was just like, there it is on a platter. Mm, that's I mean it's inspiring to hear that journey that you've been on where you had to essentially mask I suppose before and or mirror and I, I, I do you think there's an element of perhaps like low self-esteem or there was when you used to mask low self-esteem and and sort of the people pleasing element you you didn't you wanted to please the person so you kind of just mirrored them do you think that was there absolutely yeah the I didn't have any confidence I mean the person that I was pre-covid to the person I am now is not even remotely the same. Um, even when it comes down to the simple things like my fashion sense and how I present to the world. Prior to probably a year or so before COVID, I was so much more kind of quiet in the way I dressed. I didn't want to take the spotlight. I didn't want to be noticed. So I would be in just like a pair of jeans and a t-shirt and that was it. So that was my wardrobe. Um, I wouldn't dare put on half the stuff I wear now. But that's because I didn't really know who I was and I didn't want anyone to kind of call that out. I didn't want people to realize that I didn't know what I was doing. I wanted them to think that I was capable or that, you know, I was a full person, but I really wasn't. I just was getting by day by day doing what I thought was meant to be done of me. And yeah, it 
took figuring out, wait, who are you? Sit down, figure you out, and then go back into the world. Mm, that's so, such important advice, um, especially in, in the relationship topic, I think. Like, I know that there'll be a lot of people listening who are in a relationship or even really a friendship as well with, with ADHD and they're struggling um, for whatever reason, whether it's, you know, their partner is and gets frustrated with them because they, they struggle to keep conversations or they, they're hyper-focusing on something and their partner's accusing them of ignoring them. Many reasons that can cause issues in, in relationships. Would you have any advice for someone listening who is in a relationship and is having a hard time at the moment? Yeah, I'd say it's, for me, the biggest things are obviously communication, but at the exact same time, I definitely understand that initiating communication is quite hard with ADHD. That fear of conflict arising or the fear of saying the wrong thing, that's always in my brain whenever it comes to form of conflict. Like I don't want to say something during that discussion that comes off blunt, that you take blunt and then it elevates and it gets higher and higher. So my advice and what I try to do is communicate in the way you can, in the way you can best. If that means you need to go quiet for a couple of hours, that is fine. But at the same time, you have to be understanding of the other person. Like they have a right to get mad at you for certain things. They do because it, it's annoying. And in the same way they annoy you, it, it's human nature. You can't expect everything you do to be okay because you have ADHD. You need to understand that they will get mad sometimes and it's fine. As long as you find a way to communicate with that person that's effective for you both, whether that's taking time out, whether that's having a buzzword where if it's getting heated, you can say, and it just kind of like, Whoop, okay, let's reset for a second. Find a way to communicate that works for you both. And then just be honest. Say like, I've done it in the past where something has been bugging me or multiple things have bugged me every now and then, but I can't bring myself to say it. And then eventually I'll blow up and I'll get mad. And it's because all these little things have been going on. It's like, if I had just communicated that blow up wouldn't have happened. Like those emotions wouldn't be as intense as they are now. So I had to find a way to communicate with my partner. Like if you see me go quiet after something and you, you can kind of notice that something's off, come and bring it to me, sit down, just be like, what's wrong? Talk to me and don't let me push you away. Just push me to say what it is because I want to, I just don't know how to start it. And I'm scared that I'm going to upset you. So it's just finding the best way to communicate for you and them and just understanding each other as much as you can. It's, it's, that is fantastic advice. Um, what do you think the positives um, are in a relationship that ADHD brings? I think there's loads. There's the main one for me, I would say, is that it's the fun side of things. There's with ADHD, there is this childlike fun that's just always there to be had and can be tapped into at any point. Um, and it's the spontaneity of things, you know, there's, you won't get bored is kind of the way I see it is there's always going to be something new. I'm always going to be looking for something new to try and something new to, you know, do. And if I'm obsessed with something and I'm in love with someone, I want them to be involved too, because it's like, I want to share this thing that I'm now obsessed with. Mm. And I'm like, here, here's this new thing. Um, granted that changes on a daily basis and it's always something new. So it probably can get a little bit annoying here and there, but I think it just, it keeps things light and fun and you know, there's not, it helps with the worry. I'd say one of my other biggest strengths that I found in relationships is I'm, I'm that source of optimism. Mm. And when things are a bit stressful or someone struggling with something at work or career moves or all these big, important things. I'm normally always the voice that's there that's go, okay, let's just think about it. Let's think positively. This is the situation. Maybe this could happen. Maybe that could happen. I'm always going to have an idea on how we can turn that situation around and yeah, just keep bringing that positive energy. So I think those are definitely some ADHD strengths. 
Mm. No, definitely, I agree. I think it's it's, it's contagious energy, unpredictability, and the, like you said, the spontaneity, um, without a doubt. I mean, there can be some funny moments where you could get so excited about something in the short time, like, let's go out for dinner tonight, and you book a table, and then your partner gets dressed and does everything, puts the makeup on, and then you don't want to go out for dinner anymore. Something's changed. So, yeah, it, it, but I suppose that just sprinkles in the unpredictability to it. Um, gosh, um a topic that I haven't really addressed too much on this podcast yet is medication. Um, and it's a, it's a question that I keep getting or messages asking me to bring up. I've never um, t- taken any medication, so I've never really felt qualified to say it. Um, and obviously, it's, it's not giving out any advice, just your your journey and story with it. Um, I suppose. So are you do you take any t- type of medication? And 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 how's that been for you? Yeah, yeah, um, I take Alvance, um, I take it daily, and now it's great. Now I'm very happy with it, and I'm glad that I did it, but the journey was rough, and I've been very transparent about this on um, social media especially. When I was going through my process of getting diagnosis and then starting medication, I started a second TikTok account. Um, called My ADHD Diary, where I just documented everything. And on my Instagram as well, I did the same thing. I now have like a highlight on my profile, especially for medication. And it's because it was such a complicated journey. I think I went into it thinking, I'll try them and they'll work. They'll be amazing. And that did happen, but no one warns you about the roller coaster that can happen. There's a different journey for everyone. Some people get it super easy. They start the meds, they're perfect, good. For me, that wasn't the case. I remember the first day I took the meds, I basically just cried all day because I remember just taking this this pill, sitting there, and within an hour, everything that I always hear was gone. And it felt like a dream state that I was in. I couldn't hear the projector, the electricity in the projector anymore, which I could always hear. I couldn't hear the ice machine in the kitchen, which was two rooms away. I couldn't hear the constant buzzing of just the world. Everything just went quieter and calmer. And I just felt so relaxed. And I just cried and cried because I was like, people get this every day for free. People live like this. I felt cheated. I was like, this isn't fair. And... That was like the first day that was great, but then every other day that hit, things changed, side effects started to happen, and it got dark. There was a point where I took myself off the meds because you were meant to try them for X amount of time, but the thoughts that it was giving me, it was giving me really dark, scary thoughts. It was keeping me awake. It was locking my jaw, so I was constantly in pain, Um, and it just wasn't it wasn't working. So I took myself off. I was like, I'm not taking them anymore. I'm done. But then a month later, I went back, spoke with them and they were just like, it's just not the right dose. It's not the right medication. Will you be willing to try things? Um, And I kind of had to sit down and go, am I willing to put myself through maybe potentially a couple of months of hard work, hard side effects to find this perfect dose? And I decided I was. I was like, look, if it's If I can get that feeling I had on day one and lock it in, let's go. I'm so ready. And that's what I did. I took six months of different medications, different side effects and symptoms, um, some really tough patches. But once I got there and I settled on the meds that I'm on now and they started to work right, it's just I can't imagine not having them anymore. It's one of those things where I don't take them every day, like you're meant to, but you know, ADHD, we, we forget sometimes. Um, but the days I do take it, it's so aware, like I'm so aware that I've taken them. I can start tasks and I can catch myself when I'm getting distracted. You know, I've done it before where I've taken the meds and I've had a very chaotic morning and then the effects of these meds start to kick in. And there was one day where I was cleaning the kitchen and some point I turned around and was like oh I needed to put that door on the kitchen cabinet so halfway through cleaning a kitchen I'm now 
on the floor on this kitchen cabinet with a screw. And my partner's just sat there and he's like, this is just the normal now. So he's not not saying anything. <laughs> but the meds kicked in halfway through. And I literally looked at him and was like, I came in here to clean, didn't I? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, why am I doing this? And he's like, well, you're just you. I was like, no, okay. And then from that point on, I was like, you're focused. I finished the door. I cleaned the kitchen. I put away the laundry. I got ready. Everything was just like easy. There was no like ping, 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 ping. And that was like, yeah, that's for me why I take them. Because now that I've got this control, I feel like I can harness so much more of my energy and direct it properly. Um, but at the same time, when I don't take my meds, I still have a good day. You know, there's there's pros and cons to which days I take them, which days I don't. Um, some days I'll go, I don't want my meds today because I know the activity we're doing. I'm probably going to be better without them. Uh, I know medically I'm probably going to get told off for that. But it's just how I do it myself. Thank you for sharing that. Um, sort of your, your experience with them. I, I do think that's going to help a lot of people listening. As I said, it's, it's one of the key questions. And if I can just ask as many people as possible to share their story, then it, it, it will create a balanced viewpoint, right? And, it, and, it, and I think, genuinely think it will help people. Is there anything that you do, um, not necessarily every day, but like a routine or... Uh, that you th think maybe subconsciously you do to increase the the, the chances of the, the positive of, as of ADHD. For example, other people you know go for a run every morning, they breath work, yoga, stuff like that that you incorporate into your daily routine. That that is a something you do to maximize the the benefits of ADHD. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mine has always been getting ready in the morning. It's, I've always been like, I can't start the day until I take a shower and I never really understood why. But now I know it's because once I do that, once I get in the shower, come out, do my skincare, go and get dressed, even if I'm just sitting in the house, I'm still gonna get dressed. Because once I've done all that, I feel ready to start the day. But if I don't do that, if I'm, let's say hungover and I'm like, I just wanna eat something and drink water and like just die on the couch, I'm, that's it, it's a write-off. Until I've done those steps, I'm not gonna be able to do anything productive. Um, so it's just one of those things that I'm like, if I have to get up two hours early, no matter what time it is, I'm getting up two hours early to start my day right. Um, and yeah, I think that's, that's pretty much been my one. Mm. That's fascinating. Thanks again for sharing that. Um... Finally, and I think you've been incredibly honest so far, um, and that's that's the type of conversations I'm looking for on this podcast. So thank you. Um, when you see your face, like on a you know the biggest billboard in, in the the UK um, in London, and the the brand partnerships you've done, you know, some of, with some of the biggest fashion brands in the world, um, and do you feel imposter syndrome at all? Oh my God, yes, literally pretty much every day, every time something comes through and it's like, do you want to work on this? Or do you want to go to this place? Or every event I attend, I'm always just kind of in my head, like, how, why? <laughs> like, it doesn't make any sense to me. It all happens so quickly um, that, you know, imposter syndrome is something you can't really shake off, especially in a situation like that. Um, and I think I'll always have it, but I don't see it as a negative anymore. I think having a bit of imposter syndrome, I think that's fine. If anything, it's a bit of a reality check for me. Mm. It's a bit of a, it allows me to appreciate these moments and these things that are happening because it's really putting me in that mindset of being like, you shouldn't be here, but you are. You shouldn't be doing this, but you have. And yeah, for me, it's just kind of, it goes hand in hand with kind of being proud of the journey and where I've kind of come and, um, how I got here you know was just through being so honest online and just trying to be a bit different than the norm of going through social media and just seeing so much heartache constantly and so much negativity and just coming at it from a different perspective of like let's just be positive as much as we can um and that's how it all works so I think yeah imposter syndrome absolutely but I don't think it's always a negative I think sometimes you can find the positives in it yeah, definitely. No, I, I agree. Um, and it's 
I think it, especially like yourself, when you've when you've come so far in probably you know such a short amount of time relative to perhaps other people, you to to see almost you're sort of on the bottom step and you see the top step really quickly. Um, and if anything, it's sort of your it's a growth moment, right? And maybe your your subconscious hasn't caught up. Um, you've you've advanced so quickly in life in such a short period of time and, and your subconscious is the, is the, the part of it where that imposter syndrome is going hang on how the hell did that happen um, but the reality is that it has happened and it's happened for a reason and the reason is you um so yeah no i i, I agree and that's that has actually been my view on imposter syndrome um thank you for f- so much for today um just a personal question actually and uh, i've been i've been dying to ask nothing to do with neurodiversity but your your hook on your videos is you slide in on a wooden floor have you ever slipped over <laughs> yes <laughs> honestly <laughs> at the beginning when i started trying to do it i think especially this is an adhd thing too which is just yeah I, i'm invincible i can do anything if my brain's like let's do it go yeah <laughs> um so there's some days where i'm not thinking as much and i just throw myself at this floor with all the speed and velocity I could put behind me. (laughs) And it's like, oh, okay, it's not that big of a room. Like you're limited to the space you have here, Jay, and you've just gone way past that point. (laughs) Um, So there has been a few times where I've slid too far or I've tried to do a spin and I'm not a trained dancer. I don't know how to do a perfect spin or turn your head (laughs) as you're going. I just throw my body at it and hope for the best. And there's been a few, few accidents against the kitchen counter, but you know, still here. My favourite one was when you were in the background, and it took me by surprise. I think that's probably maybe why that video did so well. It was you were suddenly on the sofa in the background, on doing a handstand with your legs against the wall. And it was just the the <laughs> randomness of it, which which was so funny, so funny. But no, you've, you've clearly got um, you know the creative flair, and genius there to capture the moment, and and I think yeah, that's that's obviously why you've done so well. Thank you so much, Jay, um, for your honesty and for your time. I think it's going to help a lot of people. Thank you so much. No, thank you so much for having me and for creating this platform. Brilliant. Thank you so much. See ya.